Hey guys, I wanted to show you something that I've been working on, and if you follow me on Instagram then you've probably already seen this. One of my all-time favorite game consoles is the Sega Dreamcast. And if you're not too familiar with it, one of the more unique features of the Dreamcast is this guy. This is the Visual Memory Unit, or VMU, and it's basically just a memory card with a screen and some buttons, kind of looks like a tiny Game Boy and it would slide into the controller like this and it has this window here so that you can still see the screen while you're playing the game. Some games would display information like how much health or ammo you have left. Some games even had little mini games that you could download to the VMU and play on their own. You could even connect two of them together like this and share save data with your friends that way. So yeah, one of the more interesting and ahead of its time ideas that Sega had with the Dreamcast. And I say ahead of its time because as cool as the idea was, the technology in 1998 just wasn't quite there to make these things really compelling as a portable gaming device, which made it more of a novelty at best. So you can probably see where this is headed. I wanted to see if I could fit a Raspberry Pi in here and turn it into what I always wanted it to be growing up. Now, this has been on my to-do list for like a year and a half at this point, so even though I've seen a couple people beat me to it on the forums in the last few months, I still wanted to do my own. And here it is. I've got a Raspberry Pi Zero W in here, so it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, along with about a one and a half inch screen. I've got a charger with a micro USB port on the side for charging. It's got a 500 milliamp hour battery in it, so that should last between an hour and a half and two hours or so. And on the bottom you have access to the SD card as well as a power switch. And yeah, it's kind of limited in how many buttons it has, but you can play a lot more games than you might think. You can play any Game Boy or Game Boy Color game, any original Nintendo game, a lot of Sega Genesis games, and since I added L and R buttons on the back, you can actually play a lot of Game Boy Advance games as well. And since they actually ported a lot of Super NES games to the Game Boy Advance, those were brought over with an ABLR button setup in mind. So that means you can also play a lot of Super NES games too, like Super Mario World and a lot of the classic Final Fantasy games. Now, getting everything to fit inside here on my build was a huge pain in the butt. And the biggest reason for that is because I really, really wanted to keep the connector on the top. And the reason I wanted to do that is that I also modified a controller. I've got an Arduino inside of here as well as a battery charger. I've got a 2000 milliamp hour battery inside of this memory card. On the bottom I've got a power switch and micro USB port. I also added a select button since the controller doesn't have one. So when I put it inside here and turn it on, the image on the screen rotates the controller charges it up, and there should be enough charge in here to charge the VMU up between three and four times. And while it's in here, you can use the full set of controls to play more comfortably and play games that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, like Super NES games. And yeah, playing games on such a big controller with such a tiny screen looks a little absurd, but that's part of why I love it so much. And I know this might be a little disappointing to some people, but I'm not going to be doing as in-depth of a guide as I have for previous projects. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First, I really don't think that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to want to put one together the way that I did. It really was kind of a pain, and it's kind of messy on the inside. But the good news, and the other reason, is that Kite from the Pseudomod forums, you may know him from his super all-in-one board that he did for the Game Boy Zero project. He's working on some custom parts for this that'll make putting it together much, much easier. I'd say about at the same difficulty level as the Minty Pie. So if all you care about is the end result and you can be a little bit patient, then keep an eye on the forums and those should be available relatively soon. But if you just really want to put one together right now, then keep watching. I did take some video and some pictures while I was putting this together and put together sort of a build log slash high level tutorial that'll hopefully give you enough to go on if you want to do it yourself. All right, so taking it apart, it's pretty simple on the inside. The only things that we care about saving are the connector on the top, as well as the bottom portion of the board where the button traces are. The screen just pops right off and you can remove the connector with a bit of hot air. You could probably do it with a soldering iron as well. And then we also need to remove the chip that sits behind the screen. It comes off pretty easily with some hot air as well. And fun fact, the code name of the chip in the VMU is potato. Get it? 
potato chip. So once you have that removed, there's a cluster of pins along the bottom row on the right side here, and those all lead to the button traces. So you can use a Dremel or something to cut it just above that row of pins. And once you do that, you can use a multimeter to determine which pin goes to which button. I'll have them listed as well in the blog post. It's pretty challenging as far as soldering goes, but one thing that you can do to make it a little bit easier is to alternate which direction you have the wires facing. That'll give you a little bit more breathing room to fit each wire in there. In order to fit the Raspberry Pi inside the case, we're gonna need to remove both USB ports, the HDMI port, as well as the camera connector. This is probably the hardest part of the whole project, and a hot air rework station is pretty much a necessity for doing this. The trick for getting them to come off easily is actually adding some more solder, preferably rosin core solder, and getting it to kind of flow underneath there. It actually makes it easier to heat it up and get it off. And it'll take several minutes of heat on each port to get it to lift off. And I forgot to hit record, but you can remove the camera connector pretty easily using the soldering iron. It kind of just winds up falling apart. It's really fragile, but we don't need it anyway, so that doesn't really matter. This is what it should look like when you're done. And you can see it's quite a bit thinner than it was before. Now the screen I used is a really cheap 1.44 inch SPI display. You can find them for a few bucks on eBay. And the first thing that you need to do is remove the screen from the PCB. And you have to be really careful doing this and make sure that you kind of cut towards the PCB so that you don't cut anything on the bottom of the screen itself. Once you've cut through all the tape that's holding it to the PCB, you need to remove the actual ribbon connector from the PCB. This might be easier with some hot air, but I didn't want to risk damaging the ribbon cable or the screen. So the trick here is just to not pull very hard. Don't put a lot of force on it or you will tear the ribbon cable. And then just kind of go back and forth with the tip of your soldering iron and it should come loose pretty easily. After you do that, then you can use your multimeter to figure out which pin on the ribbon cable goes to which pin on the PCB. And check the blog post I'll have listed, for my screen anyway, which pin goes to which GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi. So now you can go ahead and connect some wires to each pin that you need on the screen itself. Again, I haven't damaged any screens doing it this way, and I've done several of them, but just be careful with that ribbon cable. And you can see here, I wound up removing one of the wires at the top and bridging a couple of the pins because I realized that those pins that I bridged were going to be going to the same place anyway. Now for the case, you're going to need to pull out your Dremel and cut some of the insides out. And you need to make sure that you cut down to about where I'm pointing here so that the whole screen can fit inside there. And to make it easier, I designed and printed out this part. This will do a couple of things. It'll line up the screen for you, and it'll also give you a couple of nice places to put your battery charger as well as your soundboard. So you can just place your screen in there and glue that part in place. And then here you can see what it looks like after you put the battery charger and the soundboard in there as well. Which by the way, I'm using an I squared S sound module for this. It sounds great, but it doesn't take up a USB port and it's incredibly loud too. And you'll notice I used the Adafruit MicroLipo for this. And the reason I didn't use the cheaper alternative board that I used on the last Minty Pi is because the battery that we're using is 500 milliamps. And that cheaper board charges at one amp and that's not recommended to charge it at a higher rate than the capacity of the battery. And then you're also gonna need to cut out quite a bit from the back side of the case so that you can fit the battery and the speaker and the LNR buttons. And you can see the speaker sits where the original one did and I've got the LNR buttons on either side of it. I'm actually using the start and select buttons from a set of DS Lite buttons to push those tactile switches so they poke out a little bit further on the back. And then the actual Raspberry Pi just kind of gets sandwiched there between the two halves. This battery door I've also cut with a Dremel and made it nice and thin and smooth and then it's just glued into place there. Now, I didn't do a very good job of taking video while I was working on the controller, but here's what I have. There's a chip on one side of the controller PCB. I went ahead and removed that, and then I figured out which pin goes to which button. And then by supplying power to one of these pins as well, we can tap into the analog controls for the analog stick and the LNR buttons. The way that those work on this controller are pretty cool. We've got these little Hall Effect sensors along with magnets, in the LNR triggers and in the analog stick itself to kind of sense where those magnets are. So anyway, by applying power to the right pin, 
where the chip was, we can read the voltage from the corresponding pins and figure out where they are that way. I've got everything connected to a cheap SparkFun Pro Micro clone, and then I've got the USB pins on that connected to some of the pins on the VMU connector. So when you plug it in, it's like you're plugging in that USB device as well. Underneath the PCB, I've got a power boost, pretty standard setup. I've got the battery pins on that connected to the corresponding pins on the battery memory card that I made. So it'll charge that up. And then I've got the five volt output connected to both the Pro Micro as well as a couple pins on the VMU connector so that it'll charge it up when you plug it in. And then here's the inside of the memory card battery. Really simple, I've just got a JST connector wired up to a couple of the pins. And since this memory card isn't attached permanently to the controller, I could actually put more of these together if I wanted uh, so that I could change out the battery. Well, I think that about does it. If you made it this far, then thanks for watching, guys. And if you wanna see what I'm doing in between videos, be sure to follow me on Instagram. I post there pretty regularly. And my goal for this year is to post a lot more videos of all kinds of different projects. I know last year was kind of dominated by the Minty Pie. So keep an eye out for that, and I'll see you guys next time.